Hello, my name is Kendall Watley. I'm a graduate student with the University of Georgia at the Tifton campus. Uh, I am in animal and dairy science studying ruminant nutrition and specifically forages. And today we are going to be talking about Clostridium shovii and the resulting disease blackleg. So just a little bit about Clostridium shovii. Uh, it is gram positive and we see it forming rods as you'll see uh, in the photo and the image on the right side of the screen is what it looks like under a microscope. Uh, these uh, Clostridium shovii uh, require an anaerobic environment uh, to continue to uh, multiply and eventually release the toxin that results in death and blackleg. Uh, and they are also spore forming. Those spores are how they travel through the soil and eventually through the animal. So where do we find Clostridium shovii? Uh, for the most part, we're going to find it in the soil. Uh, it's very, very resistant to any sort of weather, environmental factors, and even human factors. Uh, it's very, very hardy and it is really hard to get rid of once it is in your soil. Where we'll also find it is in animal tissues, whether that be its active state, uh, which is releasing that toxin and resulting in death to the animal, or it could be in the dormant state where it is just kind of hanging out in that animal's tissue, uh, waiting for that anaerobic environment to present itself for it to uh, multiply and germinate. So if we look here on the right side of the screen at these images, what we will see is tissues that have been affected by Clostridium shovii. Uh, those first two uh, photos on the bottom right, B and C, what we see is hind limb involvement uh, with the Clostridium shovii bacterium and the black leg disease. Uh, you can see in uh, that image label C that there are actually even bubbles from the gas that is produced by this toxin uh, once that anaerobic environment presents itself. And we will talk about a little bit more about that in just a moment. But um, I wanted you to really see what this disease does to uh, muscle tissue. By and large, where we see uh, black leg show up is in the large skeletal muscle groups. But as you'll see across the bottom there, those images labeled D, E, and F, uh, we've got heart, tongue, and diaphragm tissue, and it will uh, present itself in those tissues occasionally. Um, but for the most part, we're going to see large muscle groups, large skeletal muscle groups like that hind limb, limb involvement in those first two images. So uh, pathogenesis of black leg. This is the, for the most part, accepted pathogenesis. Um, there's not really a consensus and there's still some blind spots as to how uh, this bacterium goes through the system and uh, affects these tissues but this is for the most part the accepted pathogenesis we start with that uh, spore in the soil and as cattle are grazing depending on the type of year we've had if it's wet and warm uh, then those spores are going to be a lot closer to the top of the soil, making ingestion a lot more easy. Um, so while those cattle are grazing, they are ingesting these spores. For the most part, they're going to go through the gastrointestinal system uh, and cross over the bloodstream through that mucosal lining in the GI tract. We will occasionally see uh, Clostridium shovii go through the respiratory tract and enter the bloodstream that way, but uh, for the most part, we're going to see involvement of the GI tract uh, and it moves through the bloodstream into the muscle tissue uh, awaiting activation. So for this activation to happen, uh, we need some sort of trauma to happen to the muscle tissue, whether that is cattle uh, playing or fighting in the pasture, whether that is something that happens during uh, transit or handling. Uh, there has to be some sort of trauma happen to the muscle tissue, some sort of bruising uh, to create an anaerobic environment a loss of oxygen, which will allow these spores to secrete their toxin. Uh, and once that happens, once you uh, see clinical signs, and we'll talk about those clinical signs, that animal's typically dead between 12 to 24 hours of onset of clinical uh, signs. So what's actually happening in this animal? Once those Clostridium shovii spores have entered the system, uh, they have gone through the GI tract, they've entered the bloodstream, they are now in 
the muscle awaiting an anaerobic environment. And once that trauma happens to the muscle, what happens is that toxin is produced after these spores have germinated and multiplied. That toxin uh, causes necrosis in the affected tissue. And then you're gonna see swelling uh, due to the fluid and gas accumulation that happens from this anaerobic bacteria in the muscle. Uh, we're going to see all of that uh, muscle necrotize. Uh, there's a lot of death to that muscle. Uh, clinical signs that we will see if they are still alive. Uh, first one being severe lameness and swelling. Uh, I, like we said, we're, we're gonna see a lot of involvement in large skeletal muscle groups. So uh, by and large, those, la those large muscles in the legs and specifically the hind legs is where we'll see a lot of it. Uh, that area will start out very hot and painful to the touch. And as that animal uh, starts, start to succumb to this disease, uh, it will turn cold and will not be painless anymore. Um, you can kind of feel, if you were to palpate where the uh, affected area is, that, where that swelling is, uh, because of the gas produced by this toxin, we will feel kind of a crackling feeling uh, under the skin where that tissue has changed texture and that gas has been produced, you can feel the crackling. Uh, we'll also observe ruminal stasis and anorexia. Uh, that animal has a complete loss of appetite. Uh, if there is any rumen activity, it's very, very slow. Uh, and then we will see labored breathing. If the, if the lameness had not brought them to the ground, uh, the labored breathing definitely will. We'll also see uh, a heightened temperature. And as that animal starts to expire, we will obviously see that temperature start to decrease um, and become subnormal as death approaches. So a little bit about the epidemiology. Um, there's really not a consensus as to why black leg, for the most part, affects younger animals. But uh, what we do see is animal, animals from six months to about two years uh, and in good nutritional standing are usually the ones that are affected. Uh, infections typically occur during warm, wet conditions. Uh, this, the incidence of disease definitely increases because those spores are uh, more likely to be ingested as they are coming back to the top of the soil profile. Uh, cattle will not spread black leg from animal to animal. Uh, it is not contagious. The only way that they could get it from an animal is indirectly after that animal dies. If it is not disposed of correctly, uh, the spores will leach out of that animal and back into the soil. So if cattle do die, they must be disposed of as soon as possible, either by completely burning the animal or uh, covering it with lime and, uh, and digging a very, very, very deep grave to try to uh, keep those, so those spores as far from uh, the top of the soil as possible. Antibodies and colostrum from the dam will provide some active immunity uh, to, or excuse me, passive immunity to that calf after it's born. As long as they uh, got colostrum in their system, there is not a consensus as to how long that passive immunity will last. So vaccination is key uh, once they get a few months on their age. And although it is not widely described, um, there is a study showing that infected dams will pass those spores to their offspring. And if the dam uh, were to have uh, activation of those spores in her body, uh, she will pass that to the calf as well. That's what happened to the calf on the right, as you see in that image. Um, Clostridium shovii spores overtook that fetus at about 217 days in correspondence with um, the dam's expiration. So best way, best thing to do for us is to prevent Clostridium shovii from even uh, affecting the animal to begin with. So in addition to that passive immunity from colostrum, what we'd like to see is a first dose around two to four-ish months uh, with a booster following four to six weeks later. And then we would like to see an annual booster um, at least until two years of age, but maybe even longer than that. Most seven-way clostridial vaccines is, uh, you'll, you'll see it most of the time referred to as a seven-way vaccine, but there are eight and nine-way vaccines uh, 
Most all of these will cover Chauvi septicum, Novi sordellium perfringens. Across that screen, you'll see some of the commercially available vaccines right now. We've got UltraVac and UltraChoice 7 uh, from Zoetis, and then there's Alpha 7 from Behringer Ingelheim. Uh, they also have an Alpha 7 MB option that offers a little bit of more axilla bovis prevention. Uh, so some pink eye help there. Merck has a Vision 8. Uh, there's lots of different options and they're all relatively inexpensive. So there's really not a reason to be uh, not vaccinating at this point. So conclusions on black leg, uh, once clinical signs are observed, it's really too late. Death is imminent and it is quickly approaching. Vaccination is key. So make a herd health protocol today uh, that is pivotal for the health of your herd and the continuation of uh, your, your profitability and your operation. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more about Black Leg if it's something you're interested in. And here are the references for the papers and photos I used in this presentation. Thank you very much.